All right. This is a uh, last lecture before exam Friday. Hepatitis viruses. You know, we got a whole list in this group, so um, we're going to make it through a lot of viruses today. Hope you're ready. So yeah, I guess you've heard of hepatitis viruses. I hope should be familiar with that term. Right, inflammation of the liver viruses. So the thing about um, hepatitis is that we have, and just so you know, you know you can have hepatitis without having a virus. Don't don't want you to be confused about every time somebody in the hospital says, "Oh, they have hepatitis," that you go, "Well, they must have A, B, C," you know, have B or C. But 95% of the people don't know they're infected. So that's the issue. So a lot of people don't think they have it, don't realize they have it, and that's how it kind of gets its foothold on your liver. And if it is C, usually, then it actually gets into a chronic condition and causes big, big problems. So one reason, um, you know, how do you find out? I know there was a big push. It seemed like every other commercial on TV was about, hey, you baby boomers and your Gen Xers probably have hepatitis C, you need to go get tested, right? Y'all remember those commercials? So it was a big push um, for, and to everybody go out and get tested. So I don't think anybody just went out and said, let's go get a hepatitis C test. But there are, you know, some ways of doing that, which is one uh, yesterday was to donate blood. So you get a free hepatitis B and C test if you go get blood. So doing that on a regular basis, um, definitely if you're in healthcare and you get a needle stick, these are the two things that will follow up um, over a year of time. So you want to make sure that you make them follow up on that because you may not be there. Like if you're a clinical student and you get stuck, um, accidental needle sticks are one of the main ways that these two uh, are transferred. So what we don't want is this. We don't want long-term infection, chronic infection, leading to liver damage and coming up with cirrhosis and leading to liver cancer. So here's a breakdown. And I, I'm sorry I didn't check on Zoom, but I'm assuming you're hearing me or you would have said something by now. But here is a breakdown of primary causes of chronic liver disease. And uh, this is always a good test in the board. On the board, they always ask you uh, what are three reasons there's uh, liver disease, those being hepatitis, alcohol use, always show up there. So hepatitis B with alcohol, 3%, hepatitis B only, 11 and you see the biggest one over here with hepatitis C, 26%. Uh, with alcohol and hepatitis C, 14 alcohol alone, 24 So I um, heard some chatter earlier in the classroom, but you need to watch, you need to watch this right here. Um, so our patients can come in like that, and usually they come in a little jaundiced, little, little brown in the eyes, um, and we do definitely know. So if we're, um, you know, since y'all are becoming blood bankers in the hour before this one, one of the frustrating causes for blood bank is when an alcoholic shows up in the ER and you're asked to do some type and screening on that patient just in case there is some esophageal varices that rupture while he's there or she's there usually a he but it doesn't always have to be and they start bleeding so especially if they're already coughing up blood at the time of arrival so just to give you some some real life scenarios of where we see this kind of stuff so the global burden of disease study, viral hepatitis, it has surpassed all chronic infections, including HIV, malaria, and TB. Uh, it remains amongst the top 10 global killer. Uh, World Health Organization um, has a strategy to eliminate it, which is wonderful, right? Um, so 
194 governments have signed on to this and said, let's try to eliminate viral hepatitis by 2030. So one of those might be, hey, we're gonna send you funding for commercials once you get people tested. Um, because the quicker somebody gets tested, the quicker somebody may not spread it to somebody else. Okay, and hepatitis C is one of those that gets spread around either sexually, tattooy, whichever way you wanna look at it. Any transfer of blood can transfer these. So in 2016, the total deaths caused by viral hepatitis, including liver cancer, few cases of cirrhosis, hepatitis A, E, B, C, and D. We go all the way to E. Accounted for 1.3 million deaths globally, which got it past TB, got it past HIV, got it past malaria. Staggering death rates, um, despite hepatitis C medications, and that's kind of the link to the commercial was, hey, there's hepatitis C treatment. So these treatments, the one that just came out, usually the regime is if you hadn't had any other hepatitis C treatments. So if you come in and you get tested and you hadn't had any other treatments, this one's really good to go with. Uh, so that was another push for hepatitis C testing. Most of you have already been vaccinated against B. Okay, so there is a vaccine for hepatitis B. That's the good news. The bad news is there's no vaccine for hepatitis C. And that's why we're still fighting it. Uh, only 5% of the people know, because that's 95% don't know, so only five do know um, that they have it and then they can do some things to help the spread. So let's take them. Let's take them one at a time. We'll start with A. Um, Y'all are already familiar that this was area of the state had a hepatitis A outbreak a few years ago. Um, nobody's really worried about A, right? It's self-limiting, goes away. Um, it's easily spread though, once you have a, people in the restaurant business spreading it, um, as we know, as we watch that unfold. If you're from this area, you probably heard it every day. Um, it, hepatitis A virus is the etiological agent of infectious hepatitis. Classification, it is an RNA virus. So the biggest thing you're gonna see is that all the hepatitis is RNA except one, which is B, and B is a double-stranded DNA. We'll see that in just a little bit. So many cases of hep A are non-symptomatic. Liver enzymes may be elevated, but who's gonna go get chemistry tested unless you're in chemistry lab and somebody draws your blood and you run your ALT and ASTs and you end up elevation for no reason? Could be hepatitis A. If you do turn symptomatic, and there are a few, uh, Flu-like illness and GI symptoms, pain in the area of the liver. Your anatomy tells you the liver should be in the upper right quadrant. So if it's sore or hurting. And then jaundice, of course, whites of the eyes turn brown, skin turns brownish, and you're just sitting there with excess bilirubin. So that's the So the liver's having trouble. thing is, is that it takes 10 to 30 days after you're infected to be detected in the feces. So that's those windows. So every time you saw a health, a health bulletin that came out with hepatitis A, it was always back to when they thought it had been given or spread. So they may say from, you know, if you ate at the subway on July 22nd through July 30th, you may have in yeah, you've been infected with hepatitis A because there was a worker there at that time that had it. Um, after one week, symptoms, 80% of the patients have negative results in their feces. So it doesn't take long. That's what I mean. It's just one of those that, you know, your body takes care of it. Transmission is fecal oral route, which means is that our, our workers are not using the uh, hand washing hygiene. So there shouldn't be a hep A outbreak right now everybody was focused on hand washing and hand sanitizer and all that good stuff. So um, another one of those benefits or one of those positives of the COVID outbreak was that we've seen decreases in other things that come around. So to detect it, there's a rise in the titer between an acute and convalescent blood test using enzyme immunoassay. 
That was A. Yeah. Hepatitis B. Remember, there's a vaccine for this. This one. Uh, so usually, uh, before you go to clinical, we ask you, you got to have proof. Clinical site wants to know you have proof for hepatitis B virus. The good thing is, is you all are young enough that you've all had it when you were little, when you were a baby. You went through the vaccine protocol it's after your birth. Hepatitis B is now in that. So usually you have that already taken care of. If not, then you have to go as an adult and get this. So um, like I did. So this is serum hepatitis. So remember A was infectious hepatitis, Hep B is serum hepatitis, and HEPA DNA virus, HEP, HEPA comes from hepatitis, the DNA comes from the DNA, it's the DNA virus of the group, okay? It is in, enveloped, enveloped with a lipid isocosahedral, and we're gonna see some pictures in a little bit. It's very hardy, able to survive heat, up 60 degrees Celsius for four hours, and most disinfectants don't take care of it. It is viable up to six months at room temp. So definitely could be a problem. Infectivity can be destroyed by chlorine bleach. That's great to see. Because most of us, like just in our labs, we have diluted bleach that we spray on the countertops and wipe them down because we spill serum right out of our tubes and I always tell the students that you are the ones that know if you've got serum somewhere right you can't see serum okay but you'll know whether it's on your gloves and you're walking around answering the phones and hitting the keypads or you're actually changing your gloves when you know you've got serum or urine or any body fluid on you okay and then we put we do the bleach to bleach down the counters if we spill it there are three distinct morphological forms, so it's not just one. So it's got three. There's the Dane particles, which are the infectious agent or the virion. There can be small spherical particles, which are non-infectious, but they're composed of the surface antigen. We're going to dissect out the different antigens of Hep B. Then there's a filamentous form composed of surface antigen, and it varies in length and it's non-infectious. So there's three forms of hepatitis B. The one that is contagious or infectious is the virion Dane particle. So here we are, here's the Dane particle, the, the virion, which looks like what we would think, but here's the filament and the sphere of these. So this is, let's take this one apart. I like this one. So this is the double-stranded DNA right in here. Okay, and you got DNA polymerase present. What you want to see here, what I want to point out in the picture is the core antigen. Okay, so the only time the core antigen is going to appear is if the virus is replicating. Okay, so if we look at it, we have an E antigen here, we have core antigen here, so those are inside. Then you got your surface antigens out here. Okay, so we're going to see there's a, there's a, you know, we can. There's a timeline of when things show up and when things don't disappear with the hepatitis B. The good thing is, is that we're not expecting a lot of people to have hep B, but there are people that don't get vaccinated. There are people that have risky blood behavior, such as IV drug using, and we may see it. So that patient comes in, ER, we want to make sure um, we would we just don't, can't say everybody's been vaccinated, I guess. That's a good way to put it. Electromicrographs of Hep B. So here's Hep B coming into the cell. So it kind of has this, uh, comes into the endosome. Then it goes away of an uncoating. Okay, then it enters the nucleus of the cell. So then it starts this all the things we know about double-stranded DNA viruses, but using the machinery, and then you see all these Hep B viruses getting out. So let's take the timeline apart. So um, antigenic structure, we have surface antigen. Right? So that's gonna be one of our tests 
that we're going to do for a needle stick protocol. Hepatitis B surface antigen is a component of the envelope of the virus. If it's present in the blood, it's indicative of an active infection. So that's one that we want to make sure if somebody's got a needle stick that they don't have surface antigen show up. Okay, it appears during an incubation period and disappears after one to three months unless the patient becomes a carrier. So kind of, have, we're going to see windows of when these show on the timeline. There's antibody. Your body's going to produce antibody called the surface antibody, okay, to the surface antigen, and it's detectable only after the surface antigen disappears. So when does it disappear? One to three months, okay unless the patient becomes a carrier. So we've got a timeline. This antibody is protective, confers immunity, and persists for life. So if you've got hepatitis B, all right, you're going to produce an antibody to it, and you're going to have antibody to the surface antigen, because that's what, what is good about the surface antigen is, if the virus is in the blood that you get from a needle stick, like that scenario again, we would want the antibody to see the surface antigen, right? We're not too worried about the core or the E because that's inside, not going to be able to get to that. But we would love the antibody to see the surface antigen when it first arrives in the body and to get to it. That's what we're hoping for. So if you've had the vaccine, what should you have? Test, first test of the day. You take a vaccine, what do you have? Antibodies. You have this, right? Antibody, surface antibody. That's what we want. That's what you're producing. So when you say, well, I don't really, I, I might have had the vaccine when I was a kid, but I don't know for sure, or I didn't do it right because my parents didn't take me back up there to get but one. Do I have the antibody for immunity? We can do this. So you can, you know, usually in the literature or the little student handbook, it'll say either you got to show us proof that you had the vaccine, or you got to show us an antibody level that protects you before you go. There's the core antigen next. The core antigen is part of the capsid, part of the inner core, which lies beneath the envelope. The presence of an IgM antibody to the core indicates early acute infection. So we got that scenario. You've been in immunology, you know. IgM early, you know that the core is only an replication of the virus, so we've got antibody to that, we've got an acute infection. We have an early antigen called the E, hepatitis B E antigen. It appears in the serum during the acute stage of infection. It's a sign there's viral replication because those are all inside the capsid, right? You don't get these unless it's, it's doing its thing and they usually disappear. Seropositive for this antigen is very infectious, which means early. Okay, so you've got going on, it's doing, you know, because we want to do what with this? You know, I know this might be surprised, but B gets taken care of. Even if you get it without being vaccinated against it, your body eliminates B, okay? unless there's other things that come up, unless there's another story coming. But we're not worried about this turning into, oh, you got B, but most people, there is a percentage of people that are gonna go into chronic carriers, but most of the time the body's going to eliminate B and you're gonna have antibody to it. The presence of the E antibody is indicative of recovery and a good prognosis. So, I want you to think about, because a lot of students always have this issue. They always think, and I think I might've asked this in immunology, I think I did. You know, which one is worse, B or C? And most students will correlate the vaccine production, that there's a vaccine, so it must've been more important that we develop a vaccine. So it must've been more serious, B must be more serious than C, okay? Don't, don't fall down that road, don't go down that road. Keep it straight. Good prognosis. You don't see that with most things we have vaccines for, but that's one. Clinical significance. 
is that the majority of cases are asymptomatic. Uh, symptomatic cases are usually mild, but they may go severe or, I know this, this is where we, hey, we got a vaccine for it, they may be fatal. Okay, so acute hepatitis accounts for one to three percent of the cases and is associated with encephalopathy leading to liver damage. So B is definitely serious, but it's not as, oh my gosh, 95% of the people that get B are going to die, right? Only one. I know that's still a lot, but scary. <laughs> All right. If it goes chronic, right, 5 to 10% of the, with people with symptoms or elevated enzyme, chronic means that we have these issues for six months. Chronic persistent hepatitis is a benign disease. The liver enzymes usually return to normal, but the patient still is carrying the virus. Chronic active hepatitis are very serious. And this is the patient that ends up in cirrhosis, hepatic failure, or hepatocellular carcinoma. So it, yes, B can lead to these. B can lead to death. B can get serious if you're one of the unlucky ones. Hepatocellular carcinoma. I'm not sure if that's a real picture. I mean, it's kind of hard to see. It looks kind of artistic, but this is ascites fluid building up in the abdomen. This is a picture showing you the damage to the liver. Chronic hepatitis on the left, cirrhosis in the middle, and hepatocellular carcinoma to the right. Patient with cirrhosis of the liver. How do we get B? Serum hepatitis, right? Blood and blood components. Donor blood can be screened, right? We screen blood donations, so we see this. But if you've watched anything historical about HIV, you know that hepatitis B was the one correlation that we had. History told us that if the patient was positive for B, we had a test for hepatitis B, chances were they had HIV, okay? So that was just the way we couldn't, we didn't know what, where HIV was. We didn't have tests for HIV. So they had to start screening the blood for B, okay? But there was a correlation at the time between hep B infection and HIV infection. Just so you know, I think you've got this in your class the hour before now. We do do a hep B virus, C virus, HIV, syphilis, West Nile, Chagas, all being tested um, before you, the blood is safe to give to the patient. You can get neonatal infection, either through the birth canal, vaginal secretions at birth, or through breast milk to a positive mother. Diagnosis is through detection of the surface antigen or the antibody to the surface antigen using enzyme immunoassay. So here's the window that we've been referring to with B. So this is eight months and you see that there's an incubation period okay, of detecting. So here we have blue, I guess that's the first one, right? And that's the surface antigen as you see, comes and goes. You've got early antigen being the green dotted line. And then you have antibody here as we got core antibody, surface antibody, and antibody to the early antigen. You see the first one is the core. So here's your liver, liver enzyme, ALT, S, SGPT. Uh, symptoms two months down the line. Here's the incubation period, surface antigen, antibody to the core and surface antigen, antibody to the core, the convalescent period, the, the recovery period, and then late antibody, two antibodies to the surface and the core. The vaccine, which is available, original vaccine was prepared in, from plasma of the chronic carriers. Take your
pure serum. We'll give it, do a little purification, treat it with formula to kill the residual live virus that you have because you're a carrier. And then antibody production occurred in 90% of the vaccinated after two doses one month apart. Appeared to be, appears to be protective, even if you're then exposed to the virus again. The new vaccine, 10 milligram surface antigen at zero, one, and six months is produced by the recombinant strain of brewer's yeast. Okay. Effectiveness at one month, 30 to 40%, at three months, 80 to 100%, and third dose at six months, high titers to finish it up. So part of the problem is, is that we've seen this with vaccinations, just getting people back for the second COVID vaccine. This is a three series. This is zero one month later, and remember to come back in six and get your third booster, all right? So we have problems with that. The immunity persists for life. So this is the one you probably all of you got, and I got, as long as you got the three, three cases. But as you see, the reason we let you go out after the second one is we should have enough before that. So at least ask you to get two before you go. Now it's a childhood shot. It's recommended for adults with high risk of infection, with people that use drugs, jails, healthcare workers. New vaccine called Heplisave B has been licensed for U.S. And it's the first new one in the last 25 years. The new vaccine, the good thing is, is that it's given in two shots over a month. So you don't have to come back in that six month period. You still gotta come back, but you don't have to do the third dose in six months. So it makes it a little easier to get it completed. All right, that's, we've gone through A and B. Now we're gonna skip C and go to D. And basically what you need to know about D is you got to have B. Make sense? No, that, that. I think we talk, did we talk about hepatitis and immunology, didn't we touch on it just a little bit? I think I remember that. Hep D virus, it's an antigen associated hepatitis. It's distinct from B, but it's only found when you have surface antigen in the serum. So you got to have B to get D. D is an RNA virus surrounded by surface antigen and delta antigen. It's a defective antigen. It's only able to replicate if you have the helper virus of B. So it's a, it's a dual infection. You gotta have B to get D infected. Transmission is simultaneously, or it can be a super infection with B carriers. So you can have an acute sudden onset or you can have chronic and you diagnose it by looking for an antibody to the Delta antigen, thus the D name. And it's, it is makes the prognosis worse for the patient, D being there. You can get B, but if you're a B carrier and you end up with D, it's not a good prognosis. Now we look at C. Formerly known as non-A, non-B. Glad they changed it, right? Put C on there. It's a single-stranded RNA virus, Flavavir A. And infections are less severe than B, okay? So you don't really go through the jaundice or the pain of having B. But 50 to 90% of the patients that get C develop chronic hepatitis chronic disease. Transmission, blood and blood components, just like B. So it hadn't been that long that we had, you know, 1989, um, we had serological assays, introduction of routine antibody screening of the blood didn't start till 92, followed by NAT testing in 99. But we think we've pretty much got it screened out as far as giving it in the, the blood donor arena. Once you acquire C, only 15 to 25% of the infected people will clear it. Remember, B got cleared. The majority of B infections get cleared. But you gotta have treatment with C. 
75 to 85 will develop asymptomatic chronic infection, which can slowly tear up your liver. Chronic hepatitis, cirrhosis, and liver cancer. Chronic HCV infection is the most common cause of chronic liver disease and most frequent indication of liver transplant. You lose your liver. Over just five years, the number of new hepatitis C infections reported nearly tripled, reaching a 15-year high. Yeah, whether that's C being out of control or maybe what? Testing more for C. Since it has few symptoms, nearly half the people with the virus don't know they're infected. And I've seen videos forever and ever, usually this healthcare worker going, I have no idea when I got C. I'm C positive and had no idea how it happened, okay? They hadn't, didn't have a needle stick in the incident. They weren't splashed during surgery, any of those kind of things. They weren't accidentally cut during surgery. Um, they go undiagnosed, so there's limited surveillance, under-reporting, meaning the annual numbers, you know, 850 cases in 2010, and all of a sudden we jumped to 2,400 cases in 15. Maybe not a true epidemic, but maybe we're just finding that this was underreported, the 850 cases. Kills more Americans than any other infectious disease. <coughs> Where are the new cases? Your age group, as most things, 20 to 29. Three quarters of the 3.5 million Americans already living with hepatitis C are baby boomers. Just short. I know y'all asked me my age the other day. I'm not a baby boomer. <laughs> I'm a Gen Xer. You know, that sounds weird, but yes. Um, while surveillance data do not actually capture the infection rates among infants, indicate it's very growing among women of childbearing age. So it, it's still a health issue. I mean, it, it is, I've worked with plenty of healthcare workers that had C, chronic infection. Okay, they just, they, they live with it. They take medicine for it. It may not be in a good state health-wise certain times of the year um, because they're having issues okay, with this chronic infection. So we do serological assays to detect the antibodies against HCV antigens. So we do an antibody to HCV and molecular assay. So when we're thinking about the test for needle stick, usually B gets a group, okay? C only gets one. We're just looking for an antibody to C. So here's the development. We improved sensitivity and specificity in 96. We've gotten to the RNA is now detected in the blood by molecular assays as early as one week after initial infection. Therefore, molecular testing is the gold standard now because the quicker we find it, right, the quicker we can treat. And the quicker we treat, the quicker we can eliminate it. And a lot of times C becomes eliminated, okay, with treatments. So it's always good to see the new treatments coming out. So before we, we get to E, so the timeline always, you know, memories, right? Memories of the patient on the floor that in the middle of the night went down to draw blood from, very agitated 80 plus year old um, overweight female, that's the way I would describe her. So we're, we're waddling in the bed, we're, we're going back and forth, we're really kind of out of it, we don't really know what's going on. So I went ahead and ran my test and I was in the process of running my test when I get a call from respiratory going, got a needle stick. So during blood gas collection, the respiratory therapist got stuck accidentally after collecting blood from the artery, stuck herself with the needle before she could get it. Because if you've seen the, the blood, the uh, arterial stickers, you know, this is prior to having safety devices engaged, right, around those needles so we could, once we came out of the arm, 
they used to have a, this is sad, sounds weird, but in the kit itself, it had, it came with like a rubber square block. And the respiratory therapist would set that on the table or on the counter. And when they would come out of the artery, they would stick the end of the needle into that and cap it until they got to the blood, uh, blood gas machine, take the needle off and let it suck up the arterial blood. Okay. So in the process that she got stuck, it's just routine. We run these tests, didn't expect answers that we got. The patient was hep C positive. Doctor didn't know, the chart didn't know, the patient's 80 plus years old. Okay. So when I see this about it detected one week after infection, that's actually happened after it was actually quicker than that. As soon as we drew the blood from the respiratory therapist and sent it off, it was already positive for C. Okay, so it's that quick. Hep E, um, not as one that would rank in the list of things, but E is kind of hanging there. You know, it's, D was kind of barely hanging on, but D had a, a friend with B and caused some serious issues. But E is a single-stranded RNA virus. Conf infections are self-limiting, except pregnant women, okay, where mortality rates are high for if you end up with hepatitis E during pregnancy. Seen primarily in the tropical and subtropical countries. Transmission is through the fecal-oral route, contaminated food and water, just like A, okay. All right, that ends our hepatitis. Now we're going to move to token virus. Y'all ready? So now we're just going to run through because I think that the hepatitis are probably you, you should be aware of those and be like the others are going to be mainly your patients. So rubella, right? We had mumps, measles yesterday, and now we got rubella. So rubella is also known as German measles, and that simply just means it was first described by German physicians. That's got the, the name German measles. So rubella, mumps, measles, and rubella. So this is the second measles in the shot. It's the only member of the genus uh, rubavirus, closely related to alpha viruses, but has no insect vector. Rubella virus possess a hemagglutin which you were familiar with from yesterday, causes clumping in chicken and human red blood cells. Reinfection can follow natural infection. That's not good. Oh, all right. Or occur in persons who have been vaccinated. Oh, we don't like those kind of stories. In these cases, the infection is asymptomatic and there's no viremia and no viral shedding. We like that story. So we do have chance of being reinfected, but we're not going to have measles again. Some pictures. So what is the significance? It is the congenital rubella. So your OB screening, screening of your OB patients, mothers to be, should include rubella. Okay. If it if it's a a mom who doesn't have antibody to rubella and they get rubella during pregnancy, then we have issues with the babies. So we get cataracts, glaucoma, deafness, heart disease, mental retardation, premature birth, or even death. That's what we're worried about, is a non-immune mother. So basically, OB doctors will ask that you run, screen for rubella antibody. Glaucoma. Because if you get, and the good thing, well, if mom gets to the fourth month of pregnancy, there's a little danger to the fetus. I don't know if that'd be reassuring to the mom or not. Hey, you made it to the fourth month without having rubella. So baby still looks good. Uh, transmission of postnatal rubella is through breastfeeding, and the disease is usually mild. So once we get to the fourth month, um, but we definitely would want to make sure what? That mom got MMR vaccinated before she got pregnant or take it during pregnancy. In young children and adults, the virus shed in saliva and urine from person to person, respiratory secretions. Disease in young children is usually asymptomatic or mild. 
adults do experience more severe disease with rubella. To diagnose, we do throat swabs, urine collection. We can do uh, products of conception like the placenta. Antibody titers are often performed to determine the immune status of the mother before she gets pregnant or right after she does, right? We want to make sure we're not at risk for an in uterine infection with rubella. It's part of, again, part of the OB workup. Should be on your list of things to do. Direct fluorescent antibody testing. Some historical stamp out rubella or MMR. Rash looks very familiar as the measles rash. All right, alpha viruses and flaviviruses. Primary cause the disease in animals. So well, that means that usually we'll be hearing about these if we're raising horses or have livestock, stuff like that. Man becomes an incidental host because the mosquito bites the animal, comes and bites the man, and we get something in return. So these, the alpha viruses are equine encephalitis. We have a variety of those. Anybody seen these before? Anybody horse savvy? No horses? No? We need to, is there somewhere to ride horses around here? Is there? Like I could show up and we go ride. I don't know if they let you put this whole nest all Oh, yeah, that's right. I can get on. Yeah. I, yeah. I don't I'll know if you're allowed. Those are like seeing personal horses. Yeah. Oh, they are? I know Hallie Horton brought her last semester. Well, Hallie wouldn't mind me riding her horse. Probably not, but she's not here anymore. Okay. Is the horse still here? I went to her house last semester. Couple months ago, and she has like four of them outside. They just walk up right here. Yeah, okay. Now, I didn't know because I, I love doing that. I love that. So, uh, Eastern equine, Western equine, Venezuela equine. Um, basically, um, mosquitoes, freshwater hardwood swamps transmit it to the horse. Horses are susceptible. Some calls, cases are fatal. Um, but it can be. Um, the horse is the dead end, ho or, uh, dead end host, but that doesn't mean that sometimes they do these tests on these horses, and especially if you're like in a rodeo arena or you've got other horses around, your horses have to be cleared of some of this stuff before they can show up. So they don't want it spreading. Some more flavor viruses, St. Louis encephalitis outbreak. We have West Nile virus that's still going on. Usually every summer we have a West Nile case in the United States. Uh, Zika was really big in the Brazilian Olympics. I don't know if you remember that. All the athletes were worried they were going to get Zika when they were down there. A uh, yellow fever virus, we've heard of that in the history books from South America. Um, the dengue virus, um, and we see dengue break outbreaks in Florida every year. So it says tropics, but I'm pretty sure I've seen them in, in South Florida too. St. Louis encephalitis, here we are in the mosquito salivary gland, transmitting that. The Zika, if you remember, do y'all remember Zika? Have y'all heard of Zika? Okay, so in the Olympics, right, it's been around, but you know, everybody going down to Brazil was worried they were going to end up with Zika, especially if they were planning on getting pregnant or having uh, pregnancies. Uh, so the story kind of sounds familiar as today. Um, Mosquito bite, the carry Zika, the aggressive daytime biter. Uh, if you end up with Zika, you can also spread it during sex with other people. Pregnant women and their fetuses become at risk because if Zika is there during the pregnancy, it does an um, acephaly, which means it's at the head, turns into um, anencephaly, right? So birth defects, microcephaly, uh, also been associated with guillain barre But that's what we're talking about. This is what scared most people. 
And they started seeing pictures of, of kids being born with the microcephaly. Other viruses, gastroenteroviruses, transmitted fecal oral routes. We'll see these with noroviruses. I know some of y'all are getting excited about going on cruise ships, but there's always a norovirus outbreak sometime on a cruise ship that gets just about everybody sick. These are small, non-enveloped, single-stranded RNA viruses. Um, Kaliki viruses, which we saw, I think it was, was it C? That was more like a Kaliki or the D, one of them. Very hardy to not, very hardy and not inactivated by ether, pH, or heat. Most common cause of gastroenteritis worldwide. Tens of hundreds of thousands of deaths each year, particularly if it's a child under three years old. The GI disease of school-aged children and adults, it's often called the stomach flu. Highly contagious, causes symptoms like stomach ache, nausea, diarrhea, vomiting. United States, more than 21 million cases annually. Restaurants can often be a worker there, fail to wash their hands. Again, norovirus infection. And what would we do from a restaurant? What would we call that? Well, if you got sick after you ate at a restaurant, what would you say? Food poisoning. Food poisoning. Must have gave me some bad food, right? Just might have been a, an infected uh, restaurant worker. Pretty neat here. They they bind to uh, fucose. Fucose is also found in breast milk. Can't tell the difference. Part of cells. Rotaviruses, meaning a wheel, where they get their name. They're small, non-enveloped, double-stranded RNA viruses. So that's one of the, I think we hadn't seen one of the double strands of RNA. Icosahedral symmetry double caps it, so it gives it this wheel look. Pretty cool look. Causes a mild or severe dehydrating diarrhea, which can be fatal. Symptoms include vomiting, diarrhea, most often infants and breastfed babies are less susceptible because of secretory IgA from the breast milk, yay. And this was always fun because you know so much about coronavirus now. Probably nothing you don't know about coronavirus. So I was like, oh, this was, this was very limited. <laughs> now you know so much. Uh, they're enveloped helical single-stranded RNA viruses called pharyngitis, the common cold, and SARS, severe acute respiratory syndrome, or SARS-2. Which one we're dealing with, right? So it has this corona look. All familiar with that. Respiratory secretions. Lab diagnosis, a diagnosis using uh, RT PCR testing. Yay. And that was it. That was it. That was all the info we did on coronaviruses up to this point. All right. Rabies virus. We're almost done. I know it's getting close, but. I think we can get it because the last, last part of the, the lecture is pictures. Rabidoviruses, rabies, fatal encephalitis. The biggest thing is, is that you can touch a bat and get rabies. So never touch a bat without gloves if you're going to pick up a bat. That's my public service announcement of the day. Rabies can be 100% fatal if the patient becomes symptomatic. So you've got to be treated for it if you end up coming down with it. Deadly. So dogs, vaccinated. It's an important member of the Rabidoviridae uh, family. Negri bodies are associated with rabies. So that's definitely something to remember. There they are. A 
We think we understand who carries it, wild or domestic animals, bats, foxes, raccoons, skunks. There's our bats. Raccoon, skunk, fox. Crazy acting animal, they seem confused. Dogs confused, old yeller. <coughs> Person with it. And to finish up, we'll do the pox viruses or double-stranded DNA, sorry, pox or DNA viruses. Smallpox, which we feel like we've eliminated smallpox. It was eradicated in 1980. And the rest of it is all about history. Look to it. There's a vaccination. How about that needle? Put the drop of right there and then stick that in your arm. Leaves a scar, forms a lesion. That was good. Okay, very fatal. 50% of the people got it, died. And you have all these pictures. Mm, okay, there are DNA viruses. Adeno, herpes, hepatopox, parvo, human papilloma, and polymyviruses. So we'll have the quiz put up soon, and the test will be Friday. No class Friday. And uh, we'll see you uh, tomorrow in lab.